Coach Tori, and this is Raising Runners. We talk running, fitness, mental health, and so many more topics. As the founder of a youth running program, I approach all of our conversations with our youth athletes in mind and kind of have a focus around those things. But as you will see, we are finding that all of these topics relate to runners and people who like to move and do fitness or anything like that um, relates to everybody. Check it out. Hey, it's Coach Tori. And Jeff. <laughs> and that was the longest pause ever. And this is Raising Runners. <laughs> um, I like thought you froze for a second. I was worried. I think I did freeze on my end. I, I said it as soon as you said it. but Oh, you I, did? <laughs> yeah, I did. It just, uh, I don't think it went through. And we're anticipating um, some internet connectivity issues, apparently. So hang in there, everybody, because editing is not my favorite thing to do. But today we are back. It is just us two. Uh, we're going to finish up our last three topics for our running rhetoric. Um, and then we're going to move on to some other things. We are currently brainstorming some good topics for you. Still probably looking for some guests, but again, scheduling can be so challenging. So we'll kind of see how those things shake out. Um, but I guess, I guess we should still do a little update, right? Any, we can do like a mini, mini update. Any updates on your training? I actually know uh, that there are. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, for me, I'm back to uh, 100%. Uh, my times are faster than they were before. Uh, I took that time off. So I, I'm, feeling optimistic. I think my first race may be the half marathon in December down in Florida, but I'll have to wait and see. So that's, that's my current plan. That's exciting. Are you feeling better now that you've reduced your mileage a little bit this week? Uh, I am. Yeah. It was, you know, the drive back was, um, probably helped with recovery, like not really doing a whole lot of movement. So yeah, I think it's, um, I'm feeling back to normal. I'll still keep the miles down to about 40 this week from 50. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll go back to 50 the following week. All right. That's good. It's exciting. Um, no updates for me. If anybody's curious, <laughs> <laughs> is there ever, honestly, I've run three miles this week. I think, uh, yeah, that's just not, it's not happening, not happening for me. So I might just take like a, a conscious break. So I don't keep stressing myself of, I got to get out there and try to find time to run. Cause it's not not happening. But um, I guess we can get into our topics because that was a super boring update from me. <laughs> um, the <laughs> I know it's like low energy, no update. I am like not bringing it today. Um, yeah, once we get into races, I guess once, once we start doing races, it'll be easier to give updates. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah. Um, training's boring. Training can be boring. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And I like, feel like I never used to, I feel like I only used to sort of not even train. I would like run casually because I never really signed up for races, but, um, I do feel, I was thinking that today I was like, I really wish I had something on the board to kind of push me through, but maybe that's good not to have pressure right now. Um, so the first topic we're going to talk about is recovery. What are the various methods? What should you be doing? If there is a, should you be doing then we're going to talk about dogs, best running partners, or a mangy menace. Um, and then lastly, we're going to talk about runners high or running in the zone. Um, so, oh my gosh, it's been like two weeks since we've done this. We do a coin flip, right? Yeah, no reason. This one here probably doesn't need a coin flip, I don't oh. think. It, it, um, I, I think we could just talk through, you know, each section, right? Intermediate. And then at the end, we can talk about what's my go-to recovery method and what's your go-to recovery method. Sure. It's hard, it's hard to debate recovery, right? It's hard, like, well, I think we both should try to recover. <laughs> yes, right. Recovery is super important. So you can't really debate, like, should you recover? Should you not recover? Um, but I do think there is a little bit of, like, personal preference. Like you said, we'll talk about, like, what your go-to is. Um, do you want to start off on immediately after your run? What should we be doing to recover? Yeah, so so just for for people's benefit, it's uh, this is the source of this was a Mayo Clinic uh, sort of recommendation, um, and they broke it down to three phases: sort of immediately after a marathon, 
you know, within the 24 hour, 12 to 24 hours after the marathon. And then at phase three, it's sort of, you know, the next several days after the marathon. So I'll start with the immediate. Um, I think the immediate is when you've just finished the race is to, uh, you know, maybe if you can change your clothes, put on some warm, soft clothes, uh, and, and immediately, you know, start to rehydrate. So I think, you know, your body is still going to be, even though you may have been hydrating during the run, you're still going to need more liquids and fuel. Uh, so number one, rehydrate, maybe 16 to 20 ounces almost immediately after the race. If you have the option to sort of lie down, elevate your feet and legs. Um, and then it, it's important also to get into a, um, you know, some food and fuel, uh, maybe within 30 minutes after the race. And you really want to focus on like protein being a big part of that uh, post recover or that post race recovery meal. Um, the reason you want protein is protein is is essential in you know rebuilding muscle fiber, and your body's going to be starved for you know those building blocks to start recovering from that run. Um, so I'd say I'd say that's you know the step one. I think for me personally, um, I'll say I'm a uh, sort of a peanut butter and banana sandwich guy. Uh, that would be my go-to move, maybe a big glass of chocolate milk. And I would say Nestle's Quick is the, is the way to go, not Ovaltine or Hershey syrup. Nestle's Quick is uh, first and foremost. And the last thing I think you'd want to do is maybe just check yourself over for injuries, right? So you've been running with adrenaline. Now you may start noticing, oh, is my ankle hurting? Do I have any blisters? Um, just take a little bit of taking stock of your body and seeing, okay, how am I? Do I have any issues I need to address right away? And then move on from there. Yeah. Um, I know this isn't a debate, but I'm going to throw some two cents in there slightly because right. I can't <laughs> um, just, I, I don't even know if it's not a debate, but lying down, elevating your feet, great idea. But also a lot of people keep in mind that your blood pressure is probably down. So get back up slowly. Um, you'll see a lot of people will like pass out after their marathon or even just like a long run. If you lay down, you're hot, especially, um, you lay down, eventually you have to get back up and all of a sudden, you know, your vision blacks out or you get kind of woozy. So just things to keep in mind, if you are doing those kinds of things to help recover. Um, and then, especially since this was specifically, again, it doesn't only apply to after a marathon, but if you're thinking like after a race or something, um, the protein thing is important because you probably have to plan to bring some kind of snack or get some kind of snack pretty quickly. Um, the races are super nice usually, and they give out something, but they're often giving out apples, fruit snacks, banana, something like that. So um, anybody who's ever finished a race and you eat your apple, probably in like five minutes, 10 minutes, you're like starving again. Um, that's because we need more than just the apple. So bringing a granola bar, a protein bar, a sandwich, um, like things to think about to plan ahead that you, or your chocolate milk, you know, you don't want to rely on just the race to provide a good recovery fuel. Okay. Continue. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think you want, if you want to go through phase two, maybe the, the 12 to 24 and I'll chime in. Yeah. You want to have a chance to debate what I'm saying. <laughs> um all right so 12 to 24 hours after so again this is probably if you just did a marathon that is after you get home um after you celebrate a little bit again this could apply to long runs long workouts so this is probably if you work out in the morning after work the next day next morning something like that obviously you take a shower um for so many reasons right you're sweaty you take a shower um but also you know you're leaving salt gunk whatever else on your body so that's important. Um, consider something cool or cold to help promote recovery. So again, people love a cold plunge, love a cool shower. Um, I know a lot of more elite athletes will do a swim after their long runs, um, like in a cool pool outside. Um, so those are things you can think about. I do not want to do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, light static stretching, again, light Static stretching is good for after runs, not before runs. I think we'll talk about that later. Um, have a proper meal. So again, you had your recovery like immediately after food because you're hungry. Um, then you actually need to have a full meal that's balanced with all the things that you need, right? Um, it says in here, oh, celebrate. Okay, yeah. Um, limit the amount of alcohol when celebrating. I actually meant to bring that up 
in the recovery section with the food. Um, cause again, lots of races are going to have like a beer garden or something. Everyone gets their free drink afterwards. Um, super fun if you're into that, but also not great to help you recover. Um, and then, you know, if you're out partying, celebrating your marathon, you're not recovering, you're not laying down with your feet up, um, and then getting a good night's sleep. So of course, um, sleep we talk about all the time is really important to recovery physically and mentally, um, especially after you did a hard workout, a long race, you really do need to be sleeping to help your body, um, rebuild everything that was damaged. Um, also like mentally process everything that you did for the day, um, making sure you had something to eat before you go to bed, um, you know, so that you are, you're fueled. So when you get up in the morning, you're not also starving yet again. Um, what I miss. No, no, I think you, you nailed it. Um, I wasn't going to debate anything you said. I was going to just add that, you know, for me, this is the hardest part is that, is that sort of time period of between immediately after, because immediately after I can still walk around. Yes, you're tired, you're fatigued, but that, then you take that drive home and then I can't get out of the car, right? Then it's, it's like your legs are now seized up and it's like, wow, this hurts massively to even take a step and getting out of the car is absolutely brutal. Um, yeah, so that, that window is real. I find after a marathon is, is really tough, um, being motivated to take that shower and, and some of it's psychological just to get cleaned up, just feel refreshed a little bit. Um, maybe that heat, again, I'm, I'll say I'm partial to sort of warm showers, not the, not the cold uh, plunges that people seem to love. I don't love them. Um, and then, yeah, I think the food is a, is a big piece as well. And I'm not a big drinker, so I agree that limit the alcohol. Yeah, um, right, because after that amount of time, your body, like you mentioned, for the first part, the adrenaline is is wearing off. So you are now feeling all the blisters, all the aches and pains and all of your tendons, your joints, all of the pounding that was going on. And then closer to the end of that window is when you start getting um, all of the muscle soreness, right? And now you're like, I, I can't walk because it hurts and I can't walk because my muscles just aren't working. Um, so you're in kind of a bad state usually for most people. Um, again, that's probably more on a marathon effort, not hopefully not after like your usual long runs or anything. You really shouldn't be hurting that bad after. Um, and like you said, the proper meal thing, um, another place where planning ahead could be super important, right? After you are, you finally got your shower, you force yourself to do that. Um, if you're not going to do takeout or something like now you have to go cook yourself some food after you're like, do not feel like standing here. So maybe prepping meals ahead of time to make sure you have something that, you know, is going to be balanced and give you everything that you need, carbs, protein, fats, um, veggies, all that stuff. Um, you want to make sure you have all that ready because I know for me, especially like even not even a marathon, if I just had like a long day and I'm hungry, I am not making anything good to eat, right? <laughs> like I am grabbing stuff as I'm walking through the kitchen, um, putting together whatever is the quickest thing to make. So um, prepping that is probably a big game changer. Okay. Yeah, that was perfect. And then um, maybe I'll just jump into the next uh, two to three days post race. Yeah. So now you're into the um, I guess the first key is, and you're a coach, you'll, you'll probably have some more uh, points of view on this than I do, but you know, you, you should do some light walking, uh, eat healthy, you know, maybe some light massage on your muscles to, to sort of loosen them up and help them recover. I think it's probably your sort of your th three basic things. What you don't want to do is just go out and start going running it is, is what I've heard from, you know, coaches in the past. Yeah. So it's pretty much like a general, you'll, anywhere you look pretty much, you'll see that like at least a week of no running after a marathon effort is what most of us should be doing. There's a lot of studies on like, at what point, I think it's like eight days out, the muscle breakdown, you know, is all on the road to recovery better. You should be able to start running and stuff like that. Um, I should have had some more sciencey facts to go at that, but yeah. I mean, the general rule is it's like a week, but you can, if you want to take the whole week off, super fine, do nothing at all is, and by nothing, I mean, like you still go to work, you do whatever you have to do, like a normal day. So you are like moving <laughs> yeah, around, your boss, right? Your boss doesn't care. <laughs> right. No. And what that, and like, also like, you still should be doing something right. But like, you don't, you don't have to feel like you have to go to the gym. If you want to do a light walking, yoga, swimming, biking, those kinds of things. But if you want to do nothing exercise related, also still totally fine. You're not going to see like all of a sudden I'm horribly out of shape. Right. 
any of those differences you're going to feel is just because your body's tired. Um, and then like the neuromuscular stuff, you know, does start to need to be reminded, right. Of you still work out, you're still an active person. Um, yeah, I mean, that was really my only, only thing on that. Did I cut you off on finishing what you were saying? No, no, you were spot on. I was going to say, just add to the, um, you know, the, you know, the do nothing, I think, you know, yeah, certainly you're not going to get out of shape, but it does feel like to me, at least from my standpoint, that the more I move, you know, the better I feel to a point, right? You don't want to go out and run, but, you know, just laying around on the couch all day, every time you get off the couch, you hurt, right? It, it's, and that to me, if I'm walking around, it hurts for the first few minutes, but then everything loosens back up. And then you're like, okay, you know what? Now, now that recovery is working better where you don't have any pain, muscle soreness. So it, it does help, at least for me, help to do a little bit of movement. Um, and I think sleeping is critical as well. So I'll say you, you either, you want to move a bit, not, not intensely, but you also want to get maybe more sleep than you're used to getting as well. So but don't lay on the couch for, for 24 hours. Right. Yes. Move around, but definitely don't go back to running probably within a week, unless you are an elite athlete. Obviously they have a different kind of schedule and all that stuff, but um, yeah. All right. Yeah. And it seems like that's, I mean, there's a, there's a fourth phase, which is the weeks following that they talk about, like, just again, stay active, avoid going back to running your, your running routine. But I think, I think you said it, right? It's, um, you know, you may want to take the week off from running. Uh, and when you come back, you probably want to, you know, ramp back up maybe relatively quickly, but you, you don't want to jump back in and do a, you know, 50 mile week that first week back. Maybe you want to, you know, go to a 20 mile week, 30 mile week, and then go up to the 50s or whatever your number is. Right. Yeah. Typically, again, this is all just like some people's opinions, but I believe they're saying things like, the last month before your taper, you average out, um, like what those mileage is, maybe it's month or two months. Um, but what your weekly mileage was, so you don't go back you know, immediately to like your, your longest mileage week, right. You go back to a more of an average. Um, and again, unless you have another race, like very quickly, there's really no rush to get back to, you know, those high miles. Um, oftentimes they say between like marathon cycles, doing like a 5k training cycle can actually be really helpful to not only your brain, but also your body and your speed and all that stuff. So, um, oftentimes you don't need to get back to those high miles right away anyway. Yeah. We can talk about that tomorrow for, for, for my own personal coaching standpoint, because you, you know, what I end up doing is I end up getting into a training routine where I'm almost like on a marathon routine all the time. Where I'm mm-hmm. ready to do one because I'm running 50 miles a week versus just staying in shape, running 30 miles a week and, and filtering in some speed and long runs and then ramping it up uh, in a 12 week cycle up to a marathon. So I, I need to think about, do I want to just stay in shape and then just do things periodically? Or do I want to, you know, moderate that, that intensity and then ramp it up as a particular race gets closer? We can definitely talk about that tomorrow. All right. Sounds like a plan. So, <laughs> so what's your, what's your go-to recovery? So if you, if you do a long race, what is your go-to um, if you haven't said already? Um, I definitely haven't said already. I also don't. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, ideally I can say what ideally I would do because life doesn't allow, I don't think for, I don't even sleep normal. So, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, shower, nap always. I think one of the last races we did, I desperately wanted a nap um, within like two hours of getting home. Um, eating a little extra, definitely. Um, drinking a lot. I'm not really a chocolate milk person, but I also just like don't do so well with dairy sometimes. Like the idea of it kind of like, um, so that wouldn't really be probably in the cards, but um, yeah, water, electrolytes lots of food, um, a nap, a shower, wearing lots of warm stuff. I notice even if I run in the summertime, um, I would like to put like sweatpants back on and stuff because just like all the sweat and everything. And then you go inside or whatever. Um, but yeah, so I don't have like any fancy recovery routine. Um, back, back in the day we would do ice baths. And by that, I mean like 15 years ago was probably the last time I did that. Um, and that was always like a fun, thing to do when you're young. 
um, I don't know, cold, cold bones are not my thing anymore. So <laughs> not trying to do that. Well, you, um, I think on the last time we had this uh, debate, one of these debates, you, I think I agreed to do an ice bath in the future and lunges and a few other things. So mm -hmm. I, did, I did do two ice baths down in Florida. I will say the ice melted pretty quickly. So it tells me that it was, you know, the ice didn't stay as, as a layer on top of the a tub. So it, it was certainly cold, but probably not as cold as it may normally be for people. Uh, yeah. I didn't love it. I, I did it. <laughs> I, I do find, and everyone says this, right? If you force yourself to relax and just say, you know, breathe, breathe, um, then then it, it is easier. It just becomes a feeling that you have. It's not, it's not the absolute torture, the inhale that you get when you first get in, like the <gasps> right, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. So that that was the initial reaction, but again, I'd heard that that would be your initial reaction, and then just sort of stay the course, and I, and I probably stayed in maybe five or six minutes for each of the two times I did it. So, uh, you know, I may, I may do it once a week. Um, I'll let you know as we, as it goes forward, like that may be something I'll add if, if I see some benefits. Yeah. So what do you normally do besides your occasional ice bath? Uh, yeah, I, I do. Um, I, I will like you, I'll, I'll probably splurge a little bit. I probably was a little bit dedicated on food before the race and then after the race, I'm a little less dedicated. So maybe like a bowl of cereal, I'll have a little bit more of a snacky type stuff that I probably wouldn't normally have. Uh, I am a food prepper, not a like a doomsday prepper, but I do prepare all my meals ahead of time. So I usually have some go-to stuff that's pretty healthy. So it's a combination of the two things. I'll, I'll warm up one of those things, but then follow it quickly with a dessert type uh, snack. And then after that, you just sort of, yeah, you sit around a bit more than you probably normally would. I don't watch a lot of TV, but those days I probably do sit around and watch a little bit of sports. Um, and then, like I said, you try to get up and move around a little bit more. The next day, I try to get back to a, a normal routine, not a running routine, but a normal routine. Yeah, love it. Yep. All right, well, uh, I can, so, oh, go ahead. No, 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 you, you, you were transitioning to the next item and so was I. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, since there's no debate there, obviously everyone should recover. A little bit of it is fact and science. And then there's obviously some personal preferences to add in there. Um, again, that was more marathon specific, but um, recovery is still important for like every run that you do, right? Making sure that you're eating, fueling enough, drinking enough, especially as we on the, well, at least we right here in Pennsylvania, we are getting into winter. It's getting chilly. You're um, if you drink to thirst, you're really not getting that sensation as much now that it is getting chilly. So you need to really be conscious of your water intake. Um, so those are really important things to do. And then again, as it's getting colder too, making sure you're showering. So you're not just sitting in cold sweat. Um, now moving on dogs, running partners, or mangy menace. Are we debating this one or are we just running through all the, well, I'm on the side of mangy menace. So if, I suspect you're probably a running partner uh, fan. So there might be a bit of a debate here. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the day, but uh, that works for me. You want to, you um, want to take, uh, you want to take running partner and I'll, I'll, I'll follow it up with mangy menace. Sure. Well, first of all, anyone who has interest in running with their dogs or runs with their dogs currently, um, a couple months ago, it we did an episode with Jake from on dog training, literally talking all about running with your dogs. He talks about, um, kind of how to get them there, like training wise, behaviorally, the kinds of dogs maybe that are better at running, um, what is safe, you know, terrain distance, all that stuff for them, um, fueling for dogs when they're running, um, and like warm up, cool down, all that kind of stuff. So he goes into like everything running with dog specific. Um, so if you have interest in that, check out that episode, I believe it was on dog training with Jake, um, something like that, type that in, you'll find it. Um, but yeah, so while I run with my dogs, um, most of the time, <laughs> they're sometimes good. Um, you know, it is, they are great running partners. Um, especially for, I think we've talked about this so many times, right. Us introverted people who it's like, you're going running with your friends. You got to figure out how to chat with them. Nope. You're going running with your friends who don't talk now. Uh, you don't have to come up with any kind of chatting. Um, usually again, if you have a good dog, they're up for anything. So you, you know, they're not gonna, 
I have to stop. I need to run this pace. I need to do that. I mean, they're pretty consistent runners. Um, they kind of settle into a pace again. If you have the right dog, they'll settle into a pace and just kind of run with you. They're not going to slow you down. They're not going to make you run too fast. Um, so, you know, they really do make a good partner that way. Um, and then like the safety aspect of it too, again, um, for people who run solo, you probably feel a little more comfort if you're running with a dog. Um, a lot of people get dogs for protection or the perceived idea of protection anyway. Um, so that can be, you know, an added bonus to them. Um, let's see, it's more fun, right? You feel fun running with your dogs. They're having a good time. You're having a good time. Um, I feel like I don't have a great is it fun though well, no, I, so I'm mad at them right now because they <laughs> were not great on our most recent run and actually last night we were outside checking on the chickens we're running all of us are, no no one's on a leash we're just running back into the house and I ran up behind I was behind them and scared them so they both like darted past me and you know completely took out my legs I like folded into myself and like <laughs> I walk in the house and Josh is like what's wrong? I'm like, I can't breathe. I just, the dogs just attacked me, but not really attacked me. They knocked me down. <laughs> it was right, so, so dumb. Chris, you just made my point, right? So, so <laughs> I know I, I have the I worst argument my case. today. But the other thing is I, I know I haven't been to your house in like a little while because I was in Florida, but I'm sorry. Did you just say you were out checking on the chickens? Oh my gosh. We have chickens. Yeah. We'll have to show you them tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm out of the loop totally. I don't know how you got chickens, but anyway. We'll cover that one tomorrow. Um, but, but before I close my argument, because I know today is not the day to ask me about running with your dogs. I do run with my dogs pretty much every time I go running, unless I'm on the treadmill. Um, and I run with two dogs and a baby in a stroller. And they are great. They run on the street. Uh, we run in a neighborhood. We also run down like a busier road to get into other neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, they do a good job just sticking with the pace. Um, they don't, because they're well-trained dogs. Usually I roll my eyes. Um, you know, they're not stopping a hundred times to go pee. Like they know when we're running, you know, this is work. So they are kind of just like straight to business. They don't pull or anything usually around other dogs. Um, and again, we've been followed a couple of times with, by like dogs and from people's yards and stuff that leave the yard. They're not supposed to, which always makes me a little nervous, especially with, you know, the stroller. It's like, if I'm by myself, it's, feels easier for me to like evade a dog following us. Right. Um, but the stroller, you just feel a little more vulnerable. Like I'm now there's a person attached to the stroller that I'm now protecting. Um, so the dogs always do a good job, like kind of keeping tabs on that other animal without, you know, making it a whole deal. So I will say they, they are great running partners. I see people running with dogs all the time. Again, if they're good dogs, then it is, it is worth it. Yeah. But I, there are times that I get very upset with them if they, for some reason, trip me or one of them gets distracted um again few and far between but you know <laughs> oh, don't try, don't <laughs> terrible try, argument don't, don't try to mute my points that i'm about to say so i i I, uh, I, I do i do think everyone loves the idea it's it's one of these concepts ideas that sound great you mm -hmm. get this dog they run with you and it's just a perfect partnership he's sitting in the back of the pickup truck while you're driving around not that that's a good idea um and, and they just you know you're just running together your partners for life um i just think that 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 setup that dog is relatively rare uh, i think most dogs end up being like more likely um are going to trip you uh again there's probably one there's exceptions to the rules there are good dogs they're just not all good dogs um <laughs> They do like to stop a lot and pee. And certainly if you, you know, you get to a point where you're sort of going to a slower pace, I think the dog's going to suddenly think he's got time now to go do a snip over there by the fire hydrant. Again, that's not great. Not fun. Uh, so that's going to screw your, your pace up a bit. Um, you know, you certainly can't, I don't know, maybe you can, but I think it's going to be harder to take them on a speed day when your pace is going to be set for a, a much higher pace. Or those long run days where you're going out there and doing 10 miles, you know, dogs. And I'm sure that the, your, the guy that was on a few weeks ago, you know, said this as well, like certain breeds, they have limits. They need to be, you know, trained. We can get into some tips in a few minutes, but um, you know, if you're doing your long run, I'm not sure your dog's going to be up for a, a 10 mile run, depending on what your definition of a long run is. Um, you do need to be considerate of them and you need to bring more hydration not just for yourself, but for them as well. 
So that now you're carrying two water bottles, not one. Um, and not everyone's running with a stroller that's got, you know, again, I'm not saying that's easy. It's but you get all the pockets for the dogs. Yeah. 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 It's a lot, of, it's a lot harder, but then there are suddenly, you know, things that you can now, I got snacks with me and I got everything else. Um, and you need to have that well-behaved dog, which again, they're not just, you know, and, and that's hard to get. Uh, and the last thing is, you know, dogs can be a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, I won't say emotional, but they're reactive sometimes. So if they suddenly see a rabbit, a cat, someone runs by, another dog now comes into the fray. And it's not just your dog you got to worry about. You got to worry about someone else's dog coming up to yours. So there's a lot of variables that as I like to go for a run, I don't really like to deal with all those variables. So for me, I find them to be a major menace. Um, I will say Reagan wanted me to get a, um, a a cat stroller. So they do make those that you can run with your cats. So I'm like, you know, we could get one. I can do it for a walk. I don't know that I could run with cats. But anyway, <laughs> I think cats might be a better friend because they're at least in a stroller and they're self-contained. An adult. Right. They're not causing extra problems. So for all those reasons, I'm going to go mangy menace and you've already proved my point. So I <laughs> probably say no more. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I really can't defend it too, too much. Um, you know, I do like running with my dogs, but also I take them so that they're tired, you know, all the things, but um, and again, like I said, there are more tips in the episode that I did with Jake. Um, I say months ago, it was probably like six months ago. So you have to like scroll far back, but, um, just some quick things as a reminder, um, knowing your dog breed. So, you know, being conscious of what is, um, you know, feasible for the different kinds of dogs. Um, also like what is safe for them. He mentioned, um, waiting till usually they're about a year, not only just for growth, but also, um, for training to make sure that you're not just, oh, my dog's really good in the yard or my dog likes to run in the yard or my dog's good on a walk. Like you, you have to make sure that they are prepared for that. So they're not causing all these other problems. Um, also preparing them conditionally, right? Like we think dogs just have boundless energy because they're animals. Um, and you know, you might take them for a run and within a mile, they're like toast. So keeping that in mind, just like people, we need to build them up um, training them. Of course, they need to know, um, how to be safe for walking and running. Um, I think one of the tips he had was, you know, picking like a similar route that they're aware of. So they're not, um, trying to be like all, you know, dogs get like nosy and stuff. Right. So like, they already know what's here. They know what they're supposed to be doing. They don't have to be like sniffing everything. Right. Um, just like having a ritual, get them to know, like I said, my dogs don't usually like poop or pee on their runs because they know that we are running. This is, they're not supposed to be stopping a hundred times. Um, but when my son will take them for walks, they stop a thousand times to do stuff. So they do know the difference in making sure you have that kind of ritual. Um, and like you said, they have to carry extra gear, right? Um, you need to have water. You may need to have treats or something. Um, I don't think I've never heard that you have to like bring like fuel for them. Right. But water definitely, um, being mindful of the temperatures, um, too cold, too hot, different surfaces are going to be too cold or too hot. Even if outside's not too cold, too hot. Um, also thinking if you're a place that gets snow, if they salt the roads, it's going to cut up their little feet. Um, so just being mindful of different things like that. Um, they do possibly need to eat more if they're working out more. So things to keep in mind. And then, yeah, sore muscles, they can get tired. Um, Jake mentions like different like stretches to help them get warmed up, cool down. They shouldn't go immediately into their crates or something afterwards. They should be able to walk and stuff after a run. So, uh, yeah, it's a hassle to run with your dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, no, no ifs, ands, or buts. It's a hassle. <laughs> yeah, I think the other thing you mentioned temperatures and, you know, like the hot surfaces and cold temperatures with the salt that could be on the snow. I guess some dogs have these like little booties they wear for their feet. They don't have those they for your dogs. Too. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. They make, I saw Crocs for dogs at the the pet store not too long ago. I don't know what the purpose of that would be, but they do make like nice, like snowshoe one. Yeah. I'm like, what the heck Crocs for dogs? Of course I almost yeah. bought them, but you know um, yeah, but they do make like boots for running but again if you ever see dogs in shoes like they hate wearing them so i don't think you're gonna put a dog in shoes and then have them like willingly run around most dogs of course um 
I don't even want to wrap it up on this dog thing. They're fun to talk about, but <laughs> yeah, I think this one here is it's again, if you if you're lucky enough to get a great dog who's a good boy or girl, um, and will follow directions and all those things we just talked about, that then they're I'm sure they're a great partner to run with. It's probably less than half the dogs that are out there though. Way less than half, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Um, yeah, I like to say my dogs are good dogs, but then like, you know, they take a week off of running and they do it, they go out and they like forget everything they know. So, you know, um, all right, moving on and our last topic, which will probably be brief. We should have did dogs last because that was more fun. Um, runners high or running in the zone or flow state, which we've talked about a couple of times. I think I have an episode out, um, just explaining that a little better too. Um, yeah thoughts yeah i'll give you mine right away like i think i've said before certainly runners high i've never experienced so in, in my x number of years of running whether long distance or sprinting never had it don't know what it is i mean it, it's described as sort of a like a release of endorse endorphins and hormones so it's more of an a, a chemical reaction in the brain that gives you that sort of a high feeling um but i don't know about you have you ever sort of felt like you experienced runner's high no I feel like probably as a younger person I probably was just like oh my gosh I feel so good after I run and like just kind of equated those as like the same kind of thing um but no I don't I don't believe so I also like you know I'm not a big like long distance person so I usually don't really run long enough for that to happen anyway <laughs> yeah and, and you know it's like to me initially it was like what's the difference between runners high in the zone so it seems like runners high is much more of a short term short lasting euphoric feeling during the run versus the zone being much or the flow state being much more of just losing yourself during your run like so oh i ran 10 miles i i don't even remember those first those last four miles like seemed like they just flew by that seems like that's more the you know the flow state or zone versus runners high I can't say I've ever, you know, to me, I, I, every mile feels like torture. Um, but that's, you know, I, I, certainly there are runs that are easier than others. Uh, so I, I will say I've certainly felt some degree of the zone where it's like, oh, okay, that run wasn't as painful as I expected it to be or it was bad. Um, but I've never had runners high in the zone. I can't say I find myself in the zone, as I would call it, too often. I don't know. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, because again, like flow state can be something that happens not just with running. That can be, you know, other kinds of tasks that you get like hyper-focused on um, and you're really like involved in and into. So I definitely think just overall I've had flow state uh, moments and definitely with running too, but again, not really a big distance girly. So, um, you know, how often am I running that? Like, you know, I run like 30 minutes at a time often, especially now. So you're really not getting into that kind of like time that it would make sense that time would be warped because 30 minutes is pretty short. Um, but yeah, you know, I like, I like a good in the zone flow state. Um, I think it's also really important for, um, especially longer distance runners to something that they understand and like kind of have more awareness to help themselves get into that. Because again, it does help with training so much if you're not just like ticking away you know you get like that treadmill effect of like every second is like going slower and slower and you're like i've been on the treadmill for an hour but it's only been six minutes um so kind of being able to tap into that right um so yeah i i definitely am a big proponent of flow state or the zone but again if you can get a runner's high too like go for it yeah that'd be nice <laughs> I guess. Yeah. that would be great um yeah i'm I'm, uh, I'm back in love with my treadmill since i missed it for three weeks down in florida yeah. I've done three, three treadmill runs in the last 36 hours. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, loving it. Although I, I will say the last one was a little bit more like, wow, okay, you know what? I, I can see the dashboard, the time. It doesn't seem like it's going by as fast as it's, it did the first couple of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can tell in like a week I'll be hating it again. So, <laughs> but I also hate the, I, I hate, I, I dislike the cold weather. I just don't love the cold weather as much, uh, even though it's easier to run in cold weather. Um, yeah. From a standpoint of performance wise. Right. Like physically, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Your heart rate doesn't jump up and you're in Florida and you start running a you know 10 mile run. Your my heart rate goes through the roof pretty quickly and you got to drop your pace down to to manage accordingly. I just found the three runs are, I've done here 
because I just came back from there, they seemed easy in relation to that because I didn't have any heat um, raising my, my heart rate. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, so, so uh, you know, uh, there's probably no debate on the on the runner's high versus the zone. If you're lucky enough to, to achieve them, great. And as you, you just said, right, the, the, I think the runner's high is just, it's just going to happen. I don't think you can sort of make it happen. Mm-hmm. The zone, though, I think, as you were saying, it's, you know, if you mentally prepare for it, if you do certain things, you may be more able to achieve um, getting into the zone or the flow state. So, and I think, yeah, I know you had a whole episode on that, so. Yeah, Good check that one out too. Yeah, check that episode out. Plugging away today. Um, yeah. Wow, what an anticlimactic way to end. We're our... not going to end. We're not. We're not going to end. Oh, well, not... we'll end our debate. But yeah, <laughs> end our debates for for now. Um, but yeah, so that was it for those debates. Um, our running rhetoric. We're gonna, like I said, move on. It'll be a fun surprise because even we don't know what we're going to be doing next. Um, if you have any guest suggestions or you want to connect us with anybody to do an interview, uh, feel free to um, either comment on Spotify. Usually I have that question up somewhere on Spotify. If you're anywhere else, you can leave it in a review or you can email at Club at gmail.com. Um, the link is always in the bio. So feel free to do any of that to let us know kind of what you're thinking you want to hear. But lastly, a little coach's corner. Yep. Yeah, I've got two coaching questions for you. Yeah, I, I, this is my chance it. to give my free advice and then let everyone else hear it as well. <laughs> so, um, so, so last week, you, you, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about lunges and tempo runs and we brought those in. You know, the other thing I do um, running related is a lot of core work and mobility. So I'm looking for some free advice on core and mobility. So for core, one of the things I do is planks and, and for, other people's benefit like for, for me the plank is defined as sort of in that push-up position and the way i do them is then take the you know left hand move it over to my right shoulder bring it back down and do the opposite with the other hand and the idea of that is to sort of force your body to you know prevent itself from twisting so there's a little bit of stability that you've got to do with that um i still would call those sort of basic planks yes it's a step above just holding yourself up um, but I'm looking for sort of maybe the next level of a plank. I think I've sort of mastered this one, if there's such a thing. Uh, I'm trying to just get to the next level, but I'm not, I mean, I see people at, online, they're doing all kinds of crazy planks. I'm not looking to go to the crazy end. I'm looking to sort of take the next step. So maybe that would be my first question is, do you have any recommendations for my plank modifications to increase the complexity, but not too far off the charts? Yeah. Um... Well, I let you, so you're describing shoulder taps, I think. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Love a good shoulder tap. And that's great because again, that works with like the anti-rotational stability that we want for running. Right. Um, so that's great to do, uh, to the next level. You can always try doing like leg lifts, alternating leg lifts. Cause that is a different way that you are now changing. Right. So you're just in a regular plank position, bringing one leg off the ground, bringing it back switching. Um, so that's another different way that you're adding rotation that you're now trying to fight against. Um, now are you doing, are you doing that in the hand as well? Are you doing sort of the right hand and the left leg, or are you, you're just doing just the legs, just the legs. Oh, okay. Um, Cause then you start getting into something more. Well, I don't know. You could also do bird dogs, but that's not really a plank anymore. Now you're more in, um, like, uh, what is it like all fours position? And then you are doing alternating arm and leg. I can send you that too. But um, no, for that, I would just say stable arms, alternating legs. And then you also can do knee, like knee drives too in a plank position. So bringing the knee up to like close to same side elbow, you also could do um, opposite side elbow, but then you want to make sure that your hips aren't dropping as you're doing that pull as well. Um, so you can do those ones again, alternating, you can either do it where your leg is, um, your foot is like off the ground or depending on the surface you're on, you can do like a slide. So you slide your foot up, slide your foot back, slide your foot across. Um, so those are two, I would say other things to do that are kind of along the same idea of the shoulder taps, but maybe loving up a little bit. And then if you want to get a little crazy too, you know, get a medicine ball or something. And now you're doing just regular planks on the medicine ball, or then you can even do your shoulder taps with your hands on the medicine ball too. So now you're adding even extra stability or like a BOSU ball, right? You could do that too. 
Um, so it's just an extra way to add a little, little more, um, side planks are great too. I, I think nobody likes those. They are terrible in my opinion. I don't love a side plank, but you, know, you can always give those a whirl. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, it's something that's, those are, there's probably a few options. I do have a medicine ball I can use. Um, yeah. So maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll incorporate two or three different ones. And instead of doing, you know, just a hundred of the shoulder tabs, I'll, I'll sort of mix it in 25, 25, 25, 25. Still adds up yeah. to 100, as you probably could tell. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you want to add a little strength in there, too, you can get um, not like a super heavy dumbbell, but you could do um, uh, instead of your shoulder tap, you're doing a row with the dumbbell up. You've seen those. You roll the dumbbell across the row. With the so you can always do that, too. Adds, you know, you're getting your plank in, but you're also getting some more of a row movement, which is great for running as well. OK, no, no that's good. I'll uh, I'll let you know what I add. Um, you know, it. I get into a routine and like I've done these planks now for probably two years where I do them three times a week, but yeah. you know, they're not really challenging. I've sped up the time in between to make them a little bit more challenging, but if it just becomes like you did them, you're not really pushing yourself. So I, I'm looking to sort of progress a little bit from where I was. Yeah. All right. So that's perfect. And then the same thing, I, I'll, I'll say very similar um, is mobility, right? So I'm, I've never been a very flexible person. So like, I think right now I cannot touch my toes, right? So I mean, most people, probably many runners can reach down and touch their toes. I cannot. Um, and that's not because I'm 62 years old or 61 years old. It's because even in, in high school and college, I was really never that flexible. Um, so I, I'm just really doing basic stretches. I'm doing like sort of a calf stretch, a hamstring stretch, a quad stretch. And again, you can probably picture what those really are. Those are just the most basic of levels. Trying to touch your toes, trying to keep your back straight, um, grabbing your ankle and pulling it behind you. So where you're you know, pulling your quad, stretching your quad out. Uh, I do some shoulder exercises as well to sort of stretch the shoulder out. Um, but yeah, I'm looking for sort of a, again, maybe to increase the complexity um, and I'm also saying, since I've not seen any progress, my second part of the question would be, would you expect there to be, um, progress in being able to stretch further each time you do these routines? Yeah. So, um, runners, I would start with are notoriously not flexible. Um, and they also love a static stretch. So everything you're saying is like, so runner of you so um, 1950s yes <laughs> right i was gonna say like we're also stuck you know i guess like probably newer runners aren't like that but anybody who's been running for like 20 30 years you know you're not flexible and you like to just stand still and do a little like you know grab your ankle and do a quad stretch right yep. um so i think i probably put on your calendar some mobility videos and i know you were having trouble with them before i'll have to see if i can send them again in an email um I love, well, I also love prescribing people things because they'll do them. And I like, I know I don't do them, but I should, um, love to do, have people do yoga, um, or some kind of like yoga esque flow for their mobility. So again, that does take some patience of the mind and focus and things that again, us runners don't always love to do. Um, but not only is it, um, you know, you get the balance there with a yoga routine, you get symmetry, um, again, a lot of us are not super symmetrical with our bodies anyway. Um, but as runners, we are doing that just forward motion, right? Everything's moving in one direction. So, um, that does make us prone to overuse and injuries. So yoga, we are going on all different kinds of planes. So that really does help, um, with our flexibility and strength in different areas. Um, for runners, it's also great because you are focusing on your breathing and body awareness, which can be so, so helpful. Um, for so many things with us long distance runners. So those things are pretty great, um, bonuses for that. But then again, just like the nature of how you do, um, a yoga routine, usually you are adding movement with the stretch. So again, like ballistic stretching is always a no go, right? That's where you're doing those like movements, like really fast, rapid movements that are trying to like force your body into stretches. That's what you don't want. But with yoga, you're going slow flowing through, um, your muscles are getting moving around. Everything's going to start like loosening up, getting warm. So you are able to get into more of a stretch. Um, so that just like makes it more, um, helpful to actually see progress. Usually again, um, you'll see, you know, if you go on different 
uh, like YouTube or social media and you'll see videos of people like, you know, as soon as they start their yoga routine, they can't touch their toes, but then within 10 minutes of doing whatever they normally do, now they're able to touch the floor. Um, so you, you see progress even within the one practice that you're doing, but then over time, again, you, your body will become more flexible, which is again, partly in your brain, but also a lot of it is in your body as well. So kind of loosening up those muscles. Um, and then other nice thing about yoga too, is that you're getting to do the stabilizing, which we just kind of talked about with your core, right? So you're getting like a core exercise in there. You're getting some more upper body work that we don't usually get as runners as well. Um, and then yoga is like an energy producing or you're like, it gives you energy. And whereas like running and lifting and all those things are going to be depleting our energy. So it is a nice balance with that as well as we're doing something that's going to oxygenate our muscles and give us a little more energy throughout the day or some way to get energized before our run or something like that. So it does have lots of different benefits. So I do like to say yoga, um, or again, like a Pilates or some kind of just like flow, um, mobility routine, you'll go on YouTube, you'll find thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, and then dynamic stretching, of course, anybody who runs knows all about the dynamic stretching. Um, again, it depends on where in your routine you want to put that because that is great for, especially before runs, because we're now moving our muscles. We're getting warmed up. Like we're always talking about, but you're also getting that stretch, getting, you know, working that range of motion too, but it can be tiring. So that's why I like to say yeah. yoga first, because, you know, you do a dynamic stretch routine and now you're sweating, breathing heavy, your heart rates up, right. Which is why it's a great warm up. But again, if it's just like your mobility day, you don't really want to be like getting yourself all worked up and overexerted. Right. Um, but dynamic stretching is great. Uh, I feel like I had something to say about that. And now it is like poof out of my head. Oh, um, because with running, especially doing the dynamic stretches before we don't want to do those static stretches because they can make our muscles like kind of like go inactive, right? We're making them too loose and stretch before our run. So we want to be doing something like a dynamic stretch. That's going to make it a little more elastic. We actually want those muscles to be snappy. So they're working and they're ready to go instead of just like loose and floppy. And, you know, that's not really going to serve us well as we're trying to have like fast turnover and stuff in our legs. So that's why usually a dynamic stretch is what you're thinking before a run, but I would say yoga or something like that. If you want to just have like your mobility focused workout, I that's feel like I was perfect. all over the place. Now that's, that's a lot of information. So I, I, I probably need to sit down with you and just sort of go through, Ooh. um, go through it. So yeah. All, good. all right. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for doing the last running rhetoric and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you rate, review, subscribe, all the things that you can do for a podcast that you enjoy listening to. Make sure you check out social media, our website, any of those things. If you have questions, comments, interview requests, feel free to email me at marikeerunclub at gmail.com.